Okay. So, if possible, uh, we can uh, maybe start heading to your seats and we can start. Okay, so for the last session of the day, before the keynote address by Professor, Professor Timothy Mitchell, I'm very happy to welcome our speakers joining us from London, Beirut, Jerusalem, and Cairo. In this session, we'll explore and learn from a variety of architectural practices that operate within, negotiate, and subvert the political forces and contexts that shape our cities in the region. We will start with a presentation prepared by Eyal Weizmann, who unfortunately isn't able to be with us here tonight. Um, but Adrian Lahoud will assume the person of Eyal Weizmann, <laughs> a very close collaborator uh, of Eyal and uh, uh, a participant in the Forensic Architecture Project that you'll hear about. Eyal is the director of the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmith, University of London. This year, he also joined Princeton University as global professor. In 2011, he founded Forensic Architecture, a research agency that investigates through architectural tools the violations of international law and human rights. He's also the co-founder of the Architectural Collective, Decolonizing Architecture Art, Art Residency in Beit Sahur, Palestine. His publications include Architecture After Revolution, The Least of All Possible Evils, Hollow Land, and A Civilian Occupation. Join me in welcoming the person who will be representing <laughs> Jan Weizmann. It's so strange to get a clap. Um, so I have a text which Al just emailed, um, which I'm going to read out. Um, it says, hello, everybody. I'm very sad not to be with you today, especially with so many friends around. Um, but like other Israelis working on Arab cities today, I speak to you from a safe distance. Uh, it says, thank you, Amal and Nora, for the invitation, and many congratulations, Amal, for the new job, um, and thank you for tolerating my absence. And then it says something nice about me, which I'm not going to read. Uh, but actually, what I will say, maybe, is that um, Al said lots of things that I wish I'd said. So this is a kind of good opportunity. Um, okay. By truth in ruins, I mean two things. Um, first, the destruction of truth as a weapon of war, and two, the attempt to reconstruct some truth, a truth from the ruins of our cities. It is already a cliche that contemporary war is an urban phenomenon, that it involves violence against people, buildings, and infrastructure, and that the evidence is now often architectural. However, another aspect of contemporary wars is the double dimension of its violence. It is both a violence against people and things, and it is a violence against the evidence that violence has taken place at all. So this is true of the US drone campaign in Pakistan, where the CIA for years evoked the so-called Glomar response and neither confirmed nor denied that it uses drones to assassinate or not to assassinate people. It cannot even name. And this is very much true of Israel's domination of Palestinians in the 48 and in 67 occupied territories. So why is denial important? Why to deny the obvious? We can see, sometimes feel, the violence on our flesh. Because neo-colonial domination relies on legitimacy, its violence must be projected as necessary and measured as a lesser evil, perhaps. Forensic Architecture is a research agency made of architects, filmmakers, and artists, and it was established in 2010 at Goldsmiths. It seeks to use architecture to provide spatial and media anal analysis on conflict zones and to mobilize this research politically, legally, and in human rights contexts. It has provided spatial and media analysis of conflict zones to human rights organizations, prosecutors of international law, and the UN. And we sometimes work with partners and um, with various partners, and with some of them uh, are located here at Columbia University, such as Surgeon Weiss and Situ Research. 
Our project uh, is, however, more than the architectural equivalent of pathology. Although, like in pathology, we are always too late. We do seek to mobilize research methods to intervene in political situations by making claims using architectural methods of analysis and research. Producing evidence into an ongoing conflict is not only about mourning and putting the past to rest, it is an intervention in the conflict, a way of recomposing the truth from fragments and ruins. Truth is, of course, the most contested battlegrounds of conflict and often its first casualty. Truth sounds like an old, sometimes even a repressive concept in its totality, especially in our postmodern, or it says post postmodern world, but it must be owned up to again, repurposed. Composed truth is not the opposite of fiction, it is a construction, and it requires narrative and imagination, technique and patience. I'd like to share with you a few case studies. The first case I would like to share is right off the press, and it is part of an analysis Forensic Architecture did on behalf of the families of two Palestinian teenagers killed in cold blood in Butania, next to Ramallah, close to the wall on Nakba Day, May 15, 2014. Hundreds of Palestinian teenagers have been killed and wounded by Israeli soldiers and other security personnel in the West Bank in recent years. Most of these killings take place off camera and a very small minority is investigated. Bodies are buried hastily and the killers walk among us. The killing of Nadim Nawara was different. It was captured on video, a CCTV camera installed on site. He was walking alone, posing no threat to anyone when he was shot. The case could not be investigated if Nadim's parents would not insist. An autopsy was ordered and performed, and a bullet was found in Nadim's school bag. Even with the bullet found, Israel still denied its soldiers were responsible, insisting that the soldiers shot only rubber bullets and implied that the evidence was tampered with. But here, by chance, there was more than the physical evidence of the bullet, and importantly, more than just the one video. The soldiers on site were also captured on camera. In the recent decades, videos shot by NGOs and other citizen activists proliferated throughout conflict zones. However, increased availability of media sources does not always add clarity. Images from multiple sources have to be recomposed. Architecture is crucial because it helps to spatially recompose events by locating and synchronizing multiple videos in space. And let's start with a short study of the scene of the crime. That should play. Do you have video? Is the video not playing? Okay. We're having issues with the video. Did you guys check that the video was playing? Because I think it's quite important. Ah, oh, okay. So wait, let's just go back. What, do we have any other videos up there first? Is this the first one? Yeah. Okay, great. So could you play that one, please? Great. So we need to synchronize the videos of the event. There are at least four videos um, on which the event was captured, but now I'll only show you two um, and the synchronization of them. To know who shot, synchronization is hard. So we need to um, do it on the level of the frame. There are 24 frames a second, so we turned to abrupt shifts. So this was the soldier that was identified as the one shooting at the very moment that Nadim is falling. So the IDF claimed um, that you cannot fire live munitions through such an extension, and that the extension is in the red frame. So we need to undertake sound analysis to find out um, what was fired through this gun. So can we play this one with sound, please? It's 
so I don't know if they can hear me. Is it possible to play this one with sound? No? Okay, that's fine. Um, one of our members, the Lebanese-British artist Lawrence Abu Hamdan, has listened to many shots many times and identified sound patterns and processed them through audio software he uses to make his audio documentaries. Identifying the sound of live fire, it could be established that the soldier was putting the rubber bullet extension on his gun in order to hide his actions. Um, he shot live bullets through this extension. It was a premeditated killing and a premeditated attempt to hide and deny his actions. We think it is likely that the same soldier has gone on to kill another teenage, Muhammad Salama. Can we play this one as well? Yep. So finally, it was necessary to show that a trajectory exists. Although Israeli authorities initially asserted that no live fire was used by soldiers during the May 15, 2014 protests, one border policeman, whose name has not been released, has since been arrested by Israeli police and faces manslaughter charges. We undertook this work for the teenager's parents and for the DCI Palestine, but it has a larger aim, to expose the arbitrary violence of Israel's occupation and their mechanisms of denial. In every individual case, there is a folded political claim, a claim that is in excess of the individual case, a claim that cannot be resolved on the present system, under the present system of Israeli domination. It was a strange feeling to under undertake this research during the time of the Gaza war this summer, to study so closely a single death at the same time when hundreds of civilians were buried under the rubble of the destruction of their homes and their neighborhoods. But despite that, it remained important to do careful work on the teenagers from Bitutunia, a large atrocity that does not undo the, necess the necessity to study local tragedies. We are involved since several years now in work on Gaza, research with the, researching with the Palestinian Gaza-based NGO called al Mezen, the violence of so-called warning attacks on civilians. Our contribution is letting architecture help recompose testimonies. Survivors that wanted to deliver their testimony to al Mezen did so with the help of computer models. Can we play this one? But this time with no sound. <laughs> um, and also of plans. The drawings and the models helped reconstruct an event that was sometimes uh, too painful to remember. The work was later presented in the UN and other forums by political and human rights groups. And now, um, just a sneak preview um, with an amazing boost from a workshop of 50 committed architects, which is the uh, Amnesty International Forensic Architecture Bartlett collaboration I mentioned before, um, and now continued by several graduate students from CRA at Goldsmiths, we are embarking on a year-long project with Am Amnesty International on the war on, uh, on Gaza. We, also do, we, also, we do so also in the hope that the Palestinian Authority joins the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and that its new and so far fantastic chief prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda, has the spirit to bring claims against Israeli generals in The Hague. But our work does not exclusively depend on this context. The project involved building an urban model of large parts of Gaza in order to locate videos that were uploaded on social media during the war. In the 2008-2009 cast lead attack on Gaza, there were virtually no independently shot videos on social media uploaded. In 2014, the situation is very different, and we found much on Twitter and on Facebook. In this task, the Palestinian architect Hania Halabi, who was very well educated at Sanan's studio in Jerusalem, um, was instrumental. The problem we discovered was that the material came largely without the metadata intact. So we cannot even know when and where the images were taken. And this is partially why we built um, the model of these cities in 3D so that we can start to uh, reconstruct um, by analyzing the video, uh, the exact time and the location of the video. And in that way, um, try to recompose a kind of portrait of what took place during these two days um, in Gaza. So you can see here some of the um, kind of work, the video analysis work that students are, um, uh, 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 are doing at the moment um, at the Center for Research Architecture. Um, 
trying to really stitch together um, uh, fragments of very disparate kinds of information, everything from um, you know, uh, video phone footage to ambulance call logs to some of the satellite imagery that I showed you before. Um, but more on this in another opportunity. Um, the material is still in work and our modelers are still very busy working. And you can see some more images of it here. So this is how we recompose the battle timeline. And this is not done according to the battle story told by those that control space and time. So for now, thank you very much. Thank you. Moving on to Bernard Khoury. He's an award-winning architect and the founder and principal of his firm DW5. Bernard has taught at l'Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, l'Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture in Paris, and the American University of Beirut. His work has, a, has been exhibited globally, including a solo show at the Edis Gallery in Berlin, and group shows including U Prison at the Fondazione Sandretto in Torino, and Space at the opening show of the Maxi Museum in Rome. He's also the co-founder of the Arab Center for Architecture, which we heard about this morning, and was the co-curator with George Arbid, also with us today, an architect of the Kingdom of Bahrain's National Pavilion at the 14th Architectural Exhibition at the Venice Biennale earlier this year, um, also which we have seen this morning. Thank you, Bernard, for joining us. Welcome. Um. I guess we have very little time. I was given 10 minutes, so I'll make it even shorter. <laughs> um, we started this talk um, a few months ago, a while ago, in Amman. And uh, I remember getting upset at my um, good friend Amal for trying to frame me in some sort of theoretical um, posture because I was saying that um, I was resisting theory because I was saying that theory produced uh, consensual definitions uh, so Amal told me uh, in public that um, resisting theory is a theoretical posture. And that is, that's too theoretical for me. So, um, uh, so we, we were supposed to talk about the crisis of representation and uh, in the context of Arab cities. Uh, that is a very sad story. So um, I will, uh, I will avoid uh, trying to uh, tackle the discussion with any sort of theoretical postures one more time. And what I will do is go through very, very quickly and very briefly through, uh, through alliances I've built uh, in order to survive in my part of the world with protagonists that were very, very central in uh, my work. Uh, they were the context, if anything. So in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years, I've built very strange alliances, sometimes very contradictory ones. Uh, but those allowed me to contradict myself from one street corner to the other and do what I have to do. Um, in fact, these, uh, these characters I will be very, very briefly presenting are the center of a uh, book I've been working on for a while that should be in a bookstore uh, very soon in a bookstore near you. Uh, it is titled... Um, local heroes. So uh, the first uh, local hero I worked with is, is the, entertainment, the entertainer. Uh, for the entertainer, I built a nightclub that was 16, 17 years ago, a music club uh, located on a very complicated and a very complex and very loaded uh, site that was, uh, that was the site of a previous uh, a refugee camp, a Palestinian refugee camp. Uh, and uh, on that site, we, were, we, we built a nightclub. You can imagine that at the beginning, uh, the entertainer and myself had absolutely no political ambitions. Uh, we did not expect to, uh, to build any uh, 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 rhetorical monument or anything of that sort. Uh, we were just building a club. Uh, the entertainer, who is a, a fantastic person, uh, is a high school dropout, so there was no, uh, no cultural intentions here. But it's also very interesting to see how the, uh, the project was recuperated by the uh, Western press, which was fishing for sensation sens sensationalist stories uh, at the time, and still is, I think, in my part of the world. 
So very soon we became uh, the bad boys who danced on graves. And that was the beginning of my, of my career as an architect. We were, of course, very, very aware of the political charge of that site when we, when we designed that project. But sometimes when the project circulates, uh, it takes on another life. And, and, and you think that you're surfing the wave. But pretty soon you become somebody uh, you did not intend to become. Uh, another important protagonist, protagonist was the broker. The broker, uh, the, the broker who got us this piece of land, who by the time I met him, uh, history had forgotten about him, but the broker was, in the early years of the war, uh, a player, an important player uh, uh, on the political scene. Um, and he was the man responsible for wiping out, uh, wiping out that camp in February of 1976. And, um, and to use his own terms, uh, he, he cleaned up the camp, basically, in a very ugly battle in February of 1976. And by the time I met him, the broker was um, was forgotten about history, and had turned uh, into uh, into into a broker for the uh, Maronite Church. And through the broker, I met uh, the landowner, uh, the landowner who happened to be the nephew of uh, of the um, general of the Southern Lebanese Army, who was uh, basically collaborating with the uh, Israeli army to protect uh, the uh, northern border of Israel. And through his connections uh, at the time, he managed to become part of a very big deal, a very big arms sales that happened uh, in the early 90s when the Lebanese forces, the Christian militias, were, were, were selling their, uh, their weapons to the Balkans, which were igniting their own wars. So as the landowner thought he could get away with it, uh, he basically uh, uh, did not relay a good sum of money at the end of that of that deal, and spent some time in Sao Paulo. Then came back to Beirut, and became one of the major uh, shareholders, the second biggest shareholder of Solidaire, the private company that is in charge was in charge of the reconstruction of the Beirut Central District. He also bought a lot of properties, and the site on which we built that that club was uh, was his uh, was his property. Now the landowner went back to Brazil for other political reasons. And then, as he thought he could get away with it, uh, two weeks after he, he said that he was ready to testify against Ariel Sharon for the Sabra and Shatira massacre, uh, was killed in Sao Paulo in very odd uh, circumstances, seven bullets in the head, mafia style. So this puts you a little bit in the context of the people I work with and the situations I've dealt with in my beginnings. The Prime Minister, who's a, who's a much known, much more known figure, uh, Rafil Hariri, was uh, very central, uh, the mastermind behind uh, the reconstruction of the city center and, uh, and uh, heading the successive governments, the post war successive governments. The first time I met Rafil Hariri, he told me that the war was over. Uh, Rafil Hariri, obviously, again, was the, was the man behind Solidaire. Solidaire, the company for the reconstruction of the city center, commissioned me eight projects uh, in the last. 10 years maybe, within the periphery of the Beirut Central District. None of these projects were ever built. And uh, Rafil Hariri was assassinated, as you, most, most you all know, uh, on, uh, in 2005 uh, with uh, an explosive charge of over 1,000 kilos of TNT. And uh, obviously, the war was not over. The Young Entrepreneur. The Young Entrepreneur comes from a... Um, uh, uh, an industrial background. He, uh, he led uh, major industrial uh, operations both in uh, Lebanon and abroad. And then in 2008, uh, switched to real estate development. He's a childhood friend of mine. So um, we developed a project for him and then another. And at this point, we have designed, uh, either built or under construction or in development, nine projects in just a few years. Uh, so he became very quickly a very successful developer, uh, thanks to me, and um, and uh, his uh, his projects are worth uh, with the developments are worth uh, around 250 million dollars at this point. Um, the man overseas, the man overseas started his career as a bouncer in Marseille in the 1980s, and then slowly made his way up uh, to to pay to take part in much bigger deals in South America. Bogota, Sao Paulo, and so on. Came back to Beirut uh, in the late 90s uh, and became one of the major players of the nightlife. Uh, this is when I met him. We became very good friends. He offered me a, a very beautiful motorbike. 
Uh, I designed many projects for him, but this is the one that ended up uh, uh, going under construction. It is under construction right now, except that uh, the man overseas was under a lot of uh, juridical pressure about a year ago, and he disappeared. Uh, the, the, uh, no, I'm very serious. He disappeared. The official story is that he, uh, he was uh, kidnapped in Sao Paulo just over a year ago, but I, uh, I want to believe that he's still alive, and I'll see him uh, very soon, hopefully. Uh, so we're building this building. It's 140 meters tall. It's a residential uh, fortress uh, right at the gate, uh, the northeastern entrance of Beirut. It has a flying sentinel uh, that overlooks uh, the, the community and, uh, and, uh, and uh, secures the community. Uh, the corporate mogul is Kuwaiti, so I'll avoid. The banker, the banker is... Uh, is uh, leading the fastest growing bank in Lebanon right now. He moved, I think, from 34th to 4th or maybe 3rd right now, uh, largest bank in Lebanon. A uh, brilliant man that I've, uh, I've learned a lot from because banks have incredibly complex strategies of deployment in the city and they're very complex organisms, uh, uh, very sophisticated mechanisms of, of, uh, uh, at work here. So I've worked a lot with banks, but with this banker, uh, we have now a very, a very serious uh, relationship that has been going for a few years. Uh, this is the house of the Martin House of the Banker. Uh, it has 52 engines in its roof, so he can sleep under the stars. Uh, the German developer, we're not going to talk about German developers because I am Lep I'm an Arab tonight. So, although, although Germany was my first, my first project abroad back in 1999, this is where the Aedes uh, Gallery is located now. The man with the bow tie is, uh, is a young, was a young uh, modern hero uh, in the early 1960s. Um, started one of the first local architectural companies in Kuwait and did some very interesting work at the time as a young uh, modern hero, like many of those first and second uh, generation of, uh, of modern architects in the Arab world. This is the time when uh, our cities uh, of the young nations, the young Arab nations, were aspiring to produce a local modernity. Unfortunately, his company grew very big uh, lately, and uh, now has been infected by the virus of the big Anglo-Saxon corporate machines. So we've stopped our collaboration with the man with the bow tie. The Kuwaiti developer, we've done a lot of work in the Gulf, um, and it was interesting to see over the last few years that sometimes we were able to hit uh, very good uh, blows at uh, big American, Anglo-Saxon, British, uh, Canadian, South African, Australian, um, um, big corporate machines. Uh, we, were, we were much smaller, but we were able to, uh, to beat them on many fronts because we had the guerrilla-style kind of operation. And uh, so this, uh, the Kuwaiti developer heard of the noise we were making in Kuwait uh, a long time ago, so he's been a recurrent client since. For over the last 10 years, we've worked a lot with him, and uh, he's also become a friend. The son of the dictator, the son of the dictator. This is a project that started just, uh, just a few months or a few weeks before the Arab Spring. Uh, it was a very ambitious project. I don't know if it would have happened well uh, the Arab Spring, sp if the Arab Spring had not, had, not, uh, had not happened, but it was a seven and a half kilometer long intervention a single story intervention, it would have been the longest building in the world. Um, the art collector, we're not going to talk about art, and not the gallerist, and not the curator, because uh, I don't feel like talking about La La Land. And the doctor, finally, the doctor who happens to be my brother, and this is a very old collaboration. I was a freshman or, or, or I was a freshman student back then, and I was given the very modest task of, uh, of, of keeping, an, keeping an eye on a rat, on an experimental rat that my brother had stolen from the Brown University um, laboratories. Um, uh, my brother is a doctor, uh, a microvascular surgeon, and the idea at the time was that uh, we would, uh, he would uh, try to find a fresh cadaver from which he would amputate a toe and graft it on the, and amputate the, the rat's leg and graft the toe on the rat's leg. And the idea, because this rat did not have an immunity system, it would not reject the toe. And, and uh, this is, was not just a morbid operation. The idea was that we could, we could demonstrate that by, by using these experimental animals that did not have 
an immunity system, we could use them to feed the vessels of an amputated uh, member of a uh, of, of a corpse of a human corpse, while this body was until this body was ready to take the the uh, its parts back. So whether it was a toe or a, or an arm that could graft to a, a, a cow's or, or a pig's uh, body. Uh, so I was my modest task was to guard the rat and make sure the rat was okay as my brother was doing his, his own business and uh, After two days of looking at the rat in the transparent cage. I fall I fell asleep and this is when the rat uh, Trying to find its way out to crawl its way out uh, Suffocated at the corner of the of the transparent cage and the rat died because I fell asleep. So that's that's all I have to say Next speaker, hello. Sinan Abdel Qadir is an architect, urban planner, and educator practicing in Jerusalem, and leading his firm, Sinan Abdel Qadir Architects, which he established in, established in 1996. Actively engaging with social and political variables, Sinan's work has created a public public platform where the process of planning is considered to be a collective political act. Sinan teaches at the Betzalel Academy of Art, and of Art and Design in Jerusalem, where he runs the Informal Design Unit. He also serves as a guest professor at the Dessau Institute of Architecture in Germany. Sinan's work has been exhibited and published widely, including the 2007 Sao Paulo Biennale, where he published his book, Architecture of Dependency. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Noura and Amal for inviting me, as you ask, to uh, talk about my work in general, but also uh, my uh, practice and search, speci Jerusalem specifically. And uh, I will use this opportunity to um, actually to compress the 25 years of experience into 10 minutes, which is very impossible, I think, but uh, let's see. Uh, how it works here. Yeah. So I would start with, uh, I, I just uh, find to divide my presentation to three period, uh, uh, overlapped, of course. So the first <coughs> three to four years, I used to work in a studio in Germany after graduation in uh, Kaiserslautern University of, uh, School of Architecture. Uh, and uh, I was uh, actually working on competition uh, and uh, some design for uh, different um, um, projects. So the first one was this Kunst Gallery in Heilbronn, uh, and uh, another one is uh, the Zutwest Funk Radio and Television for Mainz, the uh, school as an addition of a school in uh, in, in Darmstadt and. And uh, the, actually, the recent work was the first prize winning competition uh, as a school for disabled uh, workshop. And uh, this building or the competition was not realized. And with this, after three years of uh, four years working in Germany, I decided that I have to cut my, uh, if you are, I can say, flourishing experience uh, with, with, with design, proper design, and enjoying doing design, and to go back home and uh, to start to search for what we call that time identity. Identity, identity is not about just architecture, but also this uh, um, closed space with lack of um, public space since the Israeli uh, have expropriated or uh, annexed 95% of the Palestinian land. So this is actually what we see here is the laboratory where I started to experience my architecture in that time. And in order to continue my um, work in Germany, I started with a um, project, of course, private um, residential uh, projects so for clients who looked for um, kind of modernity, but 
I prefer to elaborate on concrete and, and um, from Tado and at that time to the brutalism in Israel, which was very interesting topic to me for me. This house is uh, located in an urban context, and I uh, choose to close it to the street with a very small opening. And the interior is an open space and, and, and played with uh, different forms and, and uh, levels inside. Um, but also the scales were very transparent inside. And, and uh, of course, the entrance is uh, different than usual. It's not uh, uh, in the facade, but uh, from bottom up. Um, another project was in what's so-called uh, the Peace Oasis, Neve Shalom, which is for Arab and Jewish, their mixture experience village. And here I tried to, uh, uh, to work with the landscape and uh, to maybe to cultivate the landscape and to see how can I enter through the land and uh, use the retaining wall protecting this uh, um, central space of the house. Of course, working with different material and uh, the roof is here. I, I feel like it had to be, or to be symbolic like a magic carpet which uh, um, tried to slip from, from the, the side. It's about heaviness, which digging in the land and lightness, and uh, this element of uh, the mashrabiya, I'm sorry, is made made by wooden, and the boundary of the place or the house is the landscape. Uh, later on, I worked on another um, um, ag agriculture rural space with a family who want to enclosure their house and, and to feel protected inside. This is the courtyard house um, with very simple material because of the budget. And uh, of course, I, the, the courtyard was the main uh, space for this house or different courtyards inside. Uh, as you see, it's very protected from outside. Uh, and then I, from living at that time on the coast, uh, close to my uh, village, uh, Taibi, I experienced also to live in a Jewish uh, uh, environment. So uh, moving from there uh, to Neve Shalom or the Oasis, I, I choose to go to um, uh, what, what seemed to be an urban space to us as Arab, since we lost this urban uh, context. And my first project there was the Mashrabiya building, which actually um, the latest uh, wooden, um, wooden uh, window screen, and they transform it into large-scale stone, which allow the, um, as a, it uses a threshold between the private and the public space. And of course, it's a rebellion um, experience on the pseudo tradition, I would say, a building with stone, since it was actually a kind of law that the British mandate lived for the Israeli, and we were f and still forced to work with stone, even if it's not needed as a function. Uh, so I chose to uh, interpret it on the mashrabiya, taking the stone uh, from its origin, cutting it, and uh, bringing the tradition into this uh, um, um, technique. And and it's also uh, critic on on the what you see here, the cladding technique, and of course on the other side, it's a statement. What you see here in front of those settlements uh, surround our or the neighborhood which is located. Um, Another uh, aspect which is very important in this uh, Mashrabiya building was also uh, to criticize but also to rebel the constructing or uh, building room, which is very limited in the Arab um, uh, uh, part of Jerusalem uh, to 50% rate of the land that can be used and to 
uh, try by this envelope of, of, of stone um, to give um, the city what it's what it need the stone and the the shell but inside I, c I could elaborate during the years to extend the building actually and it became more than tw 20 hundred percent than it's uh, initiated and so we today we have actually instead of 500 square meter build about 2,000 square meter and this was a tricky uh, I would say thing that uh, bring the whole uh, neighborhood to follow this concept and now uh, the uh, authority are forced to accept this concept and because the building uh, became uh, a, quiet, a quiet representative for neighborhood. So those, this gap is as used as places where living spaces between the envelope and the interior uh, space. And it's also about sustainability. It's protecting from sun, um, uh, giving the space in between, uh, which is um, function as a chimney, uh, bringing the uh, uh, warm air uh, uh, up. And uh, uh, this building uh, doesn't need any condition or uh, air condition, I would say. <coughs> The gap here between uh, the two masses of the building allow the neighbor uh, to look through and the, the courtyard, which is one the studio here used for the apartment. Uh, I didn't mention that this is a mixed use building. It's, uh, the, the, it contain also our studio there inside. Um, during that time and after this recognition, um, Surprisingly, the, the Jewish, I would say, Israeli were, um, they suddenly uh, understood that I'm doing a special architect, let us say, and, and they want me to be involved in a uh, work of a museum uh, for uh, uh, Arab contemporary art, contemporary art there. And the place we're chosen is to co collaborate with uh, a gallery in, in uh, Mulfahim. This is the site we're chosen to do the museum. And I, I use this opportunity to bring uh, um, uh, a platform for, as a catalyst for urbanization. And uh, the way I, I um, planned the concept was to connect, to show the connection between the old part of uh, the city uh, toward the new uh, part here as a pedestrian walkway. So uh, the museum became a, a rhapsoda to on the, on the landscape you can walk on and through and experience the whole uh, maybe museological experience if there is one. And this is the, actually the debate we're not existing or, or I, I, I try to walk but I did not succeed, so I um, decided to uh, stop my work with this uh, group of uh, people who wanted to see a building above all and not this uh, museological uh, debate about uh, the identity of uh, uh, art and, 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 and museum. Uh, with this work, I, I was more and more, let's just say, uh, got more recognition and I, I got to um, represent uh, uh, my work into Tel Aviv Museum. And later on, I was chosen also to represent my work in Sao Paulo, uh, 2007. So I took the opportunity and to explain uh, the whole process of uh, working in uh, Jerusalem through um, uh, uh, wide looking at uh, history and geography, uh, starting from uh, Bilad al-Sham, uh, which to me symbolize in this term uh, uh, the Arab uh, culture, and we are actually not part of it in Israel, although we are in the heart of this, I would say, a conflict as Palestinian inside. So what I want to actually explain how this division of, of Jerusalem became the main thing in my work uh, about 
uh, uh, Jerusalem is here, and, and it, it's actually, when I look uh, and, and, and uh, zoom in on the urban fabric of Jerusalem, um, I immediately uh, understood that this separation between the east part uh, and the west part is actually about formal and what I call formal and informal uh, situation. It's also the topic uh, I'm, I'm uh, working with my student in, in B'Tselel about. And we started to uh, um, do a research about this and, and through this research, um, we came to those model which are uh, differentiating the two um, environments, uh, the instance uh, house model and the growing house and what you see here. And with this uh, perception, I start to work uh, with the population, with the dweller in East Jerusalem on their uh, um, neighborhood. Uh, they were considered as a tabula rasa uh, from the uh, Israeli authority in this case, even uh, though uh, those uh, are very close located, located very close to the old city of Jerusalem, and even uh, uh, they are uh, also considered as the expansion, future expansion for those neighborhood in Mokabir. And as you see, the separation wall is, is the, one of the main elements which uh, enclosure the, the site here we want to work on or wanted to work on. And another, another element was um, the bypass road which serve the connection between um, different settlements but it's not serving the uh, place itself or the neighborhood. And uh, the aim of the population or the dweller was how to uh, come with the idea uh, through their, um, their agreement uh, to define their plots in this way and to transform it into at the beginning, before I started working them into uh, a fragmented uh, small residential uh, project. And what we try to do is actually to bring it into a quite urban ensemble that bring very modern uh, concept by uh, maintaining what you have seen here, those uh, social and cultural agreement that they uh, did. And uh, of course we, we, we took the project more than to uh, give a general concept, an urban concept for it, and, and we tried to develop uh, even a housing project and to look at uh, the division and subdivision of the plots into parcel and to see how we can locate the building and to create um, those green spaces and, and, and the public spaces and the residential building, etc. This was a project uh, which empowered the society to go with the project and, and actually to ask, or more than to ask, to, to f um, how you can say, to um, yeah, in demand actually their rights after they know what they need and how they want the place uh, to be like, which is a very uh, modern space with uh, uh, public facilities and commerce, and it's not about just uh, housing and residential. <coughs> this is what is today, and this is their, well, their, their image, and we, we, we try to interpret it in this uh, case. Uh, another project was uh, about uh, uh, the Damascus the Gate, which is very uh, known in Jerusalem as a historic site, and it is on the edge of uh, the old city where Sultan Suleiman located, and it's also the center between the four CBDs, Central Business District, the old city, the East CBD, 
which is part of uh, the project I'm working on, and the central CDB of uh, uh, Jerusalem. And uh, the concept of this uh, project was, or our proposal was, to uh, uh, make it or, or bring it, uh, the history of it back uh, as it was in the Ottoman period. Uh, the Ottoman team to actually connect this outside the world building with, with the old city and not uh, to separate as the British mandate did as they destroyed and the Jordanian also continue with this uh, um, uh, concept until what we see today uh, the Israeli um, uh, planning and how they construct this place, the entrance of the old city. And our uh, solution or, or concept was to reconnect or to make a continuity from the old city to the mandatory uh, um, part of the city and to uh, transform the place from a, uh, as, a, for, as a gap between the three districts into one uh, piazza which contain all of these uh, facilities inside the topography and actually uh, to bring back from the history uh, through the Israeli into this uh, new concept which contain the, all, all the facilities and, and program into uh, the land, the topography and we have this very smooth slope which open the uh, piazza uh, from from this uh, condition to this one which is open to the city and contain all of the function inside. Uh, okay, I will, can uh, show you some new project after this uh, uh, struggle working with, uh, with the municipality and uh, uh, suffering from the very political condition and, and now we have in the last one or two years those new projects uh, giving us a little bit more hope to do architecture. This is the entrance of Beit Safafa, a commercial building uh, that we are now uh, uh, constructing there. And another project in Jaffa which is a new um, residential or commerce uh, complex. Thank you. Our next speaker is Magda Mustafa, Associate Professor of Architecture at the American University in Cairo and Design Associate at Progressive Architects and Regional, Depu Regional Deputy Vice President for Africa in the International Union of Architects Education Commission. Her research interests include design pedagogy, and special needs design. She has developed the award-winning Autism Aspects Design Index and is the co-author of Learning from Cairo. She's also developed Juxtopolis Pedagogy, which we will hear about today. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Nora. And thank you for this auspicious scheduling between such wonderful talks, Sinan and Bernard and Adrian as Ayal and <laughs> Timothy to come. So I think it's good timing. It also allowed for our AUC president, Lisa Anderson, who's no stranger to Columbia, to join us. So being scheduled at the end of the day turned out not to be such a bad thing. Um, so I take with my presentation two small departures from what we've been discussing today, one which is to link the research that we conducted through learning from Cairo to pedagogical notions that I practice within my studio. And the second, which is to deal with a much shorter historical period in Cairo as compared to Nasser's sweeping expertise of centuries and Leila's reflection on her mother's work of 1,001 years of our city victorious to a very, very small snapshot of Cairo in possibly its most important period of time in our contemporary history these past four and a half years since the 2011 uprising in our city and my pedagogical response to that um, event. So I'll be presenting our studio work based on this pedagogy which I call the Juxtopolis Studio which is a small unit within our practice at AUC. 
So this pedagogy, like many things, was born of necessity, a necessity to bring to the forefront of architectural education in Cairo issues which became increasingly re relevant after the January 25th uprising. Issues that we as academics were always well aware of, the right to the city, the right to public space, contestation and redefinition of ownership, and the basic human right to good architecture. But these issues were suddenly thrust to the forefront of our mainstream dialogue, which hadn't happened in uh, the near history. So this was also coupled with the relative absence of regulation for various periods of time in the past four years. And in this absence of regulation, uh, it brought about a lot of demolition and a rise, a dramatic rise in informality. It would be interesting to do a quick follow-up to David Sims understanding Cairo and updating those numbers and statistics, and I'm sure we'll find a significant uh, change in just this very short period of time. So uh, this pedagogy that I'll be presenting is as present as, as an alternative methodology to the current status quo of imposition and romanticism in our city, and it's one that's a little bit more rooted in the harsh reality of the city and what's going on. So I'll begin, um, Nasser talked earlier about the binarism and schizophrenia of our city, which I think is an excellent preface for this starting point or launching pad for our pedagogy, which uh, is the, the city of Cairo as a city that is very, very layered. A city that is stratified on the horizontal across, across its sprawl, and as David Sims describes as the urban core in Formo Belt and Desert City, but also vertically in these massive parallel street networks, roofscapes that are very much disconnected from the groundscape of the city, as well as in pockets throughout our formal city through which mixed use and informality mixed into it. And it's captured beautifully here by Egyptian artist and those of you who are familiar with his work, um, the Arte Lewa Foundation, uh, and he's an art activist, Hamdi Reda. And also this idea of the layered city, which was so beautifully captured in literature and, and later cinematically in Ali Al Aswani's Critical Amarit Yaqubian. So it's between, through, and weaved amongst these layers that we define our city as that our pedagogy takes form. So Cairo, like many cities that we've seen this morning, many Arab cities, many cities in the developing world, is a city of contradictions and contradictions that are often very, in very close proximity and completely juxtaposed. In this case, heritage and modernity. In this case, great wealth that exists in our gated communities outside of the city with uh, completely unsustainable massive golf courses that are juxtaposed, again, in very close proximity with informal mass housing. So even these gated communities where tens of billions of dollars have been invested and understandably protected, are not immune to the informal migration of the service sector that then needs to exist in close proximity to serve them. So you create almost uh, a perpetual continuation of this juxtaposition. And even the city in itself as a whole can be seen as a juxtaposition of urbanity and desert and man and the elements as almost an oasis city. Um, and these juxtapositions are also found in the more intangible and include social cultural practices. Most recently, we've seen a juxtaposition of commerce and protest, as seen in this image from Tahrir Square during the critical 18 days of the January 25th revolution. And what's interesting is that so agile and mobile is the informal trade sector in Cairo, that at times the vendors would arrive at the protest gathering before any other response, and they would remain there and I myself personally experienced being able to eat batata and doramashwi on one side of the square and hear bullet shots with possible fatalities just a few meters away on the other side of the square, which is a very controversial juxtaposition in our city. And these juxtapositions also take on some comedy. We have here, for those of you who don't speak Arabic, a very confident woman standing nonchalantly outside of the window of a train um, car marked only for men. But sometimes it's tragically humorous. This is an image I see every day on my commute to AUC. Um, and it's seen in this cathedral that's literally built on, the, on Cairo's parallel urbanscape on the city's rooftops. If you look closely, you can see that the church not only spans the rooftop of one building, 
but its scaffolding to erect it and finish its facades is erected on a neighboring building. And this is a site I challenged to find in very few other cities than Cairo. And it begs the question, what is it in our city's urban and social density and dynamics that would physically force a building off the street up onto the roofscape in this sort of way? The most important um, juxtaposition that we've been looking at in the Juxtopolis studio and, and through this work has been between the formal and the informal. And uh, Sinan hinted to that issue that is not unusual, of course, in many of our cities. It's perhaps very predominant in Cairo. Again, I'll reference David Sims, who estimates about 70% of Cairo's population is now living in informal settlements. That's by population, not by built-up area, because it's a much denser built-up area in those parts. And in the work that we did in Learning from Cairo with my colleagues um, Omar Nagetzi and Beth Stryker, we found uh, one of the main focuses of the, the conference or the symposium and ultimately the book became defining what informality meant and how different it is in different parts of the world. We are looking at informality in Mumbai, in South Africa, in Southern America. But what we found universal is that what we call informal is quite formal and quite self-organized and quite standardized. And it does have a pattern to it which is quite universal across these different geographic landscapes. And this informality um, is quite interesting in how it's negotiated. These negotiations happen very organically and they take on this surprisingly modular formal expression and these negotiations are spontaneous and organic and fluid and involve a constant redefinition of boundary and power and ownership. And they're very often outside any regulatory institutional process, as evidenced in this cartoon that uh, Omar and Beth produced for the office building where, or the residential building where they have their offices in downtown Cairo, with this almost cartoonic conversation of the different stakeholders negotiating how the informal space in front of this small Art Deco building in downtown Cairo would actually be resolved. And this formal informal negotiation is also very seasonal. You see it here in Ma'edat Rahman, or the mercy tables that happen during Ramadan. And it's beautifully orchestrated how these are put out and brought together and put back out again twice a day within a span of an hour or an hour and a half. And I find the definition of informal particularly interesting and in contextually subjective in this case. In Arabic, we use the word ashwa'iyat, which literally transform, translates into chaoses, if there's such a word, or chaotics. And um, one researcher who's doing some interesting work called the Shadow Ministry of Housing in Cairo has an excellent series of documentaries called The Right to Housing. One of them is titled Dimish Ashwa'iyat ya Basha Dimaghudet Zateya which translates, this is not, these are not chaoses, this is self-reliance, which I think is a very interesting redefinition of what informality is. So the result of these negotiations between formal and for, informal is far more layered and organized than many believe. You can see here a photograph from another book by Beth and Omar called Archiving the City in Flux, where you see these layers of people praying informal vendors um, in a fruit market, other informal vendors selling something else, and then formal shops on either sides of the roads. I mean, it was very lucky that this street just happened to be in the Qibla direction so they could pray this way. Uh, but it is an interesting, to me, image of what we call informal that is actually quite self-organized and formal. And what's interesting about informality is that it's an urban manifest. I see it, or I like to define it as an urban manifest of community needs, a checklist of what is lacking, and a result of the power and ownership formulas that exist in urban space. I know my time is short. I'll try and wrap it up. So uh, to take Schopenheimer's description of architecture as frozen music and add to that Hubert Klumpner's definition of architecture and urbanism as frozen politics, I would like to add that informality is a frozen audit of a community's needs and a frozen result of the power struggles that achieve them. And I like to look at informality in that way and learn from it in that way. So from all of this came the Jixtopolis pedagogy, um, which is an academic approach to learning from Cairo and res resolving how to design within it as developed and practiced in our studio. 
The pedagogy presents urban areas as juxtapositions of these often opposing forces, layering them and negotiating between them, over, around, and through them to uncover a middle ground. As Rao Mahotra says, between the simple binary either or approaches. Jixtopoulos defines architecture as the inter-multi and cross-disciplinary negotiations between these forces, forces of context and the needs, desires, hopes, and aspirations of a community. So these are the basic three principles that we um, start our work with. Over the past four years in my studio, we've been selecting different sites throughout Cairo, sort of, Leila said, an urban laboratory, looking at our city and the issues, and um, they're always based on searching for contradictions, searching for juxtapositions, searching for places where uh, there's contestation and there's friction amongst two seemingly opposing forces. And the task always is to find a way to mediate in between. I was talking to Mono earlier about trying to figure out a middle ground between top-down, bottom-up approaches, and that's really very core to this approach. So these are the sites that I'll go through very quickly. An interesting starting point that many of my debates with my students starts with is this slide, which is the 2050 vision for Cairo 2050, which any of you who know anything about Cairo would realize would displace hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to stretch from Gamat al-Dol Arabeya and Mohandasin all the way to the pyramids in just a bulldoze, a continuous bulldozing effect. The first project deals with a site that is directly in the train of that new urban plaza. Um, it deals with an area behind Magr al the historical aqueduct, and we began with this uh, image from Fez and this, um, uh, I guess, counter position to just preserving uh, heritage and rather reusing it in approach of urban husbandry. Uh, this student proposed a work-live uh, community that would be able to replace the old tannery district once it's been removed and change the trade of the people as opposed to displacing them completely and divorcing them from their original community and workplace. The second project, which I found very interesting, takes the idea of um, a social virtual world like Facebook. The project's called Streetbook. It's a hub for NGOs located in Nainasira, in the older part of Cairo. It presents a very mobile and flexible project that would reach out to the city through these container-like uh, pods that could move out and connect back into this hub. This third project, who I know Mohammed Assad particularly likes, <laughs> it looked at the garbage collectors community in Cairo, which is a very interesting uh, phenomena. The garbage collectors community prior to the government's decision to um, formalize the process of garbage collection and waste management in Cairo was a fairly, if unhealthy for them, but very efficient system. I'm told that about 80% of the garbage that they collected was completely recycled, which is a percentage that was being achieved in the 1980s that all of us would even aspire to with the technology we have today. So this student took the process, this organic process of how they manage their waste, and it's interesting that they planned and designed their spaces, these informal, ugly, what we want to destroy spaces, they built them around this process of recycling. So if you took the recycling process, all you'd have to do is build walls and floors around it and that became their home. And they completely reflected the process itself in building their community. And even the site that she chose was an abandoned quarry, so she was even recycling architecture and recycling abandoned spaces. And she built um, the vocabulary on an existing tradition of these carved uh, spaces. This is the Samain Cathedral in Mu'attam Hills, which is part of this community. This community is a predominantly, if not 100% Coptic uh, Christian community. And her project is what I like to call non-architecture architecture. It was built completely underground. It reused an existing quarry space, so there was very little new structure being made but it was presented to connect this contradiction between the people and the city. Um, this final few slides, this represents a project that we're actually working on at the moment in Ramsey Square, which is a very interesting um, uh, space. 
Uh, it's very, very layered. We have uh, the 6th of October bridge flying over. We have the underground um, metro station underneath. You have the train tracks. You have the informal traders. You have the bus station. And I tell myself every day as I drive past it, if I could take a snapshot cross-section, there would be hundreds of people within meters of me that I will never meet, never deal with, never have any contact with. And that, to, that disconnection to me is very interesting to look at. This project is still under, in the process. I'm, I'm going back to their crit on Tuesday, I hope. This final project, just very quickly, um, resides on the Nile front um, in Maizi where there is literally a high-rise elitist community wall that blocks an informal community um, that's hidden to the back. And this community is so, this informal community in the back of Athar and Nebi is so disconnected from the rest of the city that a lot of inhabitants in these elite towers don't even realize it exists. And within a few meters of these high-rise concrete towers is this abandoned port and the informal settlement that over the years grew around it. And the, the graffiti that our students found in their field work, um, I'll read it to you in Arabic, in colloquial Arabic we call the Nile al-Bahr, which actually means the sea, and this translates for them to see the river we no longer can see the sky and these towers have blocked off all access for this community, um, even to the basic elements of air and water and sky and sun. So our project worked with mapping what I call urban narratives of the citizens of this informal community, overlaying them, trying to find potentialities. We call them in our studio urban days in the life. So they take almost an anthropological approach to discovering the traditions and practices of the people inhabiting and overlaying them and looking for potential connections. The project proposed linking some fingers through, breaking through this high-rise elitist wall to step back, reconnect, and reclaim the Nile front for the community um, in the back of this elitist uh, Maizi high-rise complex. And it culminates in this floating park which would require no land. It's all a floating technology that would connect with these urban fingers that would be very multifunctional. With have, they'd have commercial opportunities. So they would connect the formal and the informal communities. And that's our hope. And I'm going to leave you with this very final slide in one of my favorite pictures of a t time in Cairo that we all experienced. The building to the left is AUC's downtown campus. And this photograph by Ur Ursula Lindsay, um, I'd like to leave you with because I believe it to be the future role of the architect as I envision it or as I would like my, to train my students to be. The role of dissolving the separations, negotiating the seemingly impossible juxtapositions, and giving the people their right to their city. Here, Budun Hawa'id do so through graffiti art painted on the concrete block security walls erected during the revolution by the security forces. And I'm hoping that we can learn from this and navigate our city's juxtaposition to address architectural and urban imposition in a similar way. Thank you. So now for uh, the discussion. Uh, Laura Kurgan is joining us. Laura teaches at Columbia University of GSAP and directs the Visual Studies Curriculum in the Spatial Information Design Lab. Her work explores digital mapping technologies, the ethics and politics of mapping, and the art, science, and visualization of data. Her publications include Close Up at a Distance, Mapping, Technology, and Politics. Her work has been exhibited at the Cartier Foundation in Paris, the Venice Architecture Biennale, and the Whitney Altria, MACBA Barcelona, and the Mu Modern Museum of Art. Also joining us for the discussion is Mark Wasuta, who also teaches at GSAP, where he's director of exhibitions and co-director of the Critical, Curatorial, and Conceptual Practices and Architecture program with Phyllis D. Scott. He's curated and produced numerous exhibition, exhibitions globally, including La Fine del Mondo at the 14th Architectural Exhibition at the Venice Biennale, and the inter and Invention at the 31st Sao Paulo Art Biennale. He's also co-editor and co-author of Dan Graham's New Jersey. Thank you for doing this, and we can uh, have the discussion for 30 minutes before moving on to the keynote. Thank you.
اسمعها هون حد <تصفيق> Okay, so I know we're at the end of, a, of an incredibly long and great day, <laughs> um, you know, with all kinds of input from multiple directions. Um, so I think this panel really um, is about uh, cities in, in some way in a permanent state of conflict. So I think we can, we can sort of progress with the, with the, dus with the discussion from there. Um, and you know, in terms of the of the challenge of the of the of the conference, which is about architecture and representation, in this sense, I think um, architecture never stops representing in an active uh, sense and in a present tense from draw from its drawings, you know, for pre the pre existence of a building um, to its role in the city, to its formal language in everyday life, um, in terms of its in states of economic boom and also and also in conflict. So, um, um, so that's the one sense of, of representation. And in another sense, nothing changes in architecture without changes in modes of representation. And that whoever the first panel uh, person was talking at the very beginning of the day showed this incredible sweep in our changes in cities of, in, uh, particularly in Arab cities over history. So, um, so that's in, in a sense the questions I have um, to, to each of the panelists is about the instruments and tools um, which you use to represent and make architecture and also how does that um, allow you to change um, what you think architecture does. So, so in that sense, you know, how does architecture um, in each of your presentations, how does architecture represent? What does architecture represent? Who does it represent? And most importantly, the question I want to address is how can we change what architecture represents, you know, in fact, through the instruments of, um, of representation? So we had, you know, an incredible range of, of speakers over here, and I don't think there's, you know, there's, it's, it's not so much what's in common um, about what they've said, but the, the situation of conflict. So I think with Eyal and the forensic team, it's um, architecture as a witness to conflict. Um, uh, Bernard Curie, you know, I, I know that you're always um, incredibly, um, what do you call it? I don't know, I, I don't wanna, um, I don't wanna put it, I really admire what, uh, what you do and the fact that you've, stayed and built in Beirut over this time of conflict, um, and we could talk about it afterwards, but I think, you know, in some ways, Beirut is not the best example of how to resolve conflict, what, that history of conflict through its architecture, and in some ways, you said, and maybe I'm wrong, but it's almost as if you said the war allowed you um, to build. Um, you know, it allowed you to get your commissions, and so I have a, I, 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 I'm slightly uncomfortable with that, but I really admire the way and the way in which you have have done what you what you do. Um, you know, which is different from Senan, where, where there's a almost a quiet way of um, of addressing conflict through the small scale of the house and the small changes. You know, that that you can do um, to change patterns in the way we live. Um, but it's almost like an architecture as a cultivator. I, you know, that's how I saw a lot of a lot of your work, and that design um, is a catalyst for negotiation, um, for people to demand their rights. And again, you know, the incredible admiration for that kind of slow work you've done um, in, in staying in one place and addressing archite the, the architecture of conflict. And then Magda. Um, you know, architecture as a response to extreme ju juxtapositions. You know, I know it's through through the work of your students, but um, again, uh, just what those juxtapositions are is between the formal and the and the informal, and it's going to become. It, it really is a mode of uh, in many cities. Um, you know, so I think that's you know that's at the basis of of um, all of these presentations. And the question is, is architecture enough? You know, is architecture enough to do what each of these people are trying to do? Seems to be always architecture and, right, in relation to this kind of 
permanent conflict, which is, I think, going to be the future of many cities. Okay. Uh, so uh, you should all think about Laura's question <laughs> while I continue. And, yeah. and I want to thank Amal and Nora and all of the speakers and the audience today for sticking it out. The, I, just to pick up on that, I, I would pull out of AL's text and Adrian Wiseman's presentation, the term, the logic of violence, which I think is something that the forensic project is trying to come to terms with and trying to find, let's say, a shift in representational tools from, let's say, motifs and questions of form to how one uses representational strategies in the service of composing truth and composing testimony. And I think it's an incredibly interesting provocation for all of us here and also for this panel. So just to follow up on Laura's insistence on this question of conflict, uh, violence, and threat, which you may respond to more broadly than uh, precisely political threat and political instability. There are also questions of various financial instabilities, et cetera, that <coughs> follow. But, but, but and, 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 and I don't want to in any way preempt Laura's question, so I'm going to add just one more small question to the back of this. And in, in doing this, I, I want to recall a talk that happened here yesterday in which the school invited Angela Davis to speak, and, and she pointed to the, a strange representational moment, let's say, if not a moment of uncanny recognition, in which the gas canisters used in Ferguson were identified by Palestinians as those that were also used in Palestine. And, 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 and it seems like this points to another curious condition that we may, be able, may all be able to speak to. And, and it also helped me think about Nora's provocation that we are here traversing territories because it made me ask, thinking of the gas canister, what it is to traverse a territory and, and who is traversing and, 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 and what is traversing when we think of territories in the contexts in which you all work. And, and, and just to expand on this slightly, uh, my, my own very thin knowledge of the situations in which you're describing was gained by visiting the, I'm going to call this provisionally, the Middle East through a project here at GSAP, Collecting Architecture Territories. And while traveling, we spoke to a number of museum directors, gallery directors, and, and directors of cultural institutions to ask about their mission. And in many cases, the mission was to collect and show and showcase the work of the Arab world. And, and we heard many times how the Arab world was, or the region, was the, the more appropriate term than the Middle East, obviously. But the, the definition of the Arab world was ambiguous. In many cases, each institution described the boundaries, this ambiguous spatial territory, quite differently. Um, and it makes me think that similarly the term Arab city might be subject to uh, the same uh, ambiguity. And so maybe rather than a question, it's an invitation to all of the speakers to comment on what work this term Arab city is doing in holding together your talks or the talks today or this entire event and asking what maybe is holding it together, but also what distinctions that that, that term might be concealing, and, and what happens if we start disarticulating that term Arab city through the projects, through your own research, and, and through the, the events today. And, and, and here to come back to that question of territory and Angela Davis's you know, beautiful example of the gas canister, to ask what forms of territorial traversal might help us think the condition of the Arab city differently, and, and, and maybe this is a way to come back to Laura's question about conflict, conflict and threat. Okay, so you all have two questions, <coughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah. I could try to start. Um, you know, what, actually what you're both saying reminds me of um, uh, Tony Shaka, a, a Lebanese architect, um, teaches at Alba. Um, I, I read an interview with him recently um, and he was asked the question, you know, what do you think of the MENA region, kind of Middle East, North Africa? And his response was, you know, well, 
you know, Middle East, like middle of what, and, and, and in relationship to what, and, and he says, um, you know, is this uh, in relationship to Europe, you know, Europe that's afraid of um, uh, Arab migrants, or is it in relationship to the fact that during the revolution in Cairo, um, protest was be, protesters were using slogans from the French Revolution, you know, and the Angela Davis comment is beautiful because I think it is actually about those trans transversalities uh, finally, far more than these kinds of uh, categories um, like, like the Arab city, let's say. Um, in terms of conflict, I actually think that the role of, of architecture is, is not to resolve conflict at all because there's no moment where conflict goes away. It's to use it productively and to try to move the terrain of conflict um, and to mobilize it. And I, and I think when you look at the forensic architecture work, what it does simply is to try to use technology um, as an entry point to reorganize existing problems, in fact, to kind of uh, somehow unsettle problems from their, um, their, let's say, some of their normative framings, and by entering into them into a new way, in fact, to, um, to shift them productively. <coughs> Um, I don't think it has as its horizon to kind of like resolve conflict. In fact, it has as its horizon to move conflict onto onto new grounds, and I think that's um, that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, yeah, I, that, I think that's a very very um, uh, yeah fundamental um, fundamental idea. But there's that, you know there's no horizon in which these things just dissolve away. Well, it would be nice to think there would be. So, you, you, so you, you were saying yeah. that conflict allowed me to build? You, yeah? said, you just about said it. <laughs> no, this is what you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that bad? No, you talked about the, um, the, the who was it, the, the minister, in the minister example that gave you the possibility of doing eight buildings or whatever you did in the middle, um, in the middle of, Beirut at a time where... No, but those didn't yeah. get built, so... They didn't? No, okay. they did not. Okay. No, they did not. I noticed you didn't show very many buildings. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think every, every project... No, every project... Think, yeah. uh, we, have, we, we, we have about, at this point, over 150 projects in our archives. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a lot of work and some uh, at very different scales. Uh, and I think every project is, is a different story. Uh, I've given up on trying to uh, on trying to, uh, to to stick any terms or any any sort of definitions on on, on the context, but particularly Beirut, huh? because uh, every story is very different. Um, I don't think I can even think I can, I can even talk about uh, conflict as, as something as a thread that you find uh, in 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 my various works. Uh, no, no, I started my career in the entertainment industry, building nightclubs and, and restaurants, places uh, that are very futile to start with, that are not supposed to have any political content whatsoever. Uh, and I did not work during the war period. I, uh, the, war, war, the, the, the war as, at, as, uh, as, as history, history has put the war supposedly between 1975 and 19. 90, obviously things are not resolved at this point, but I came back to Beirut in the so-called post-war period uh, where we were expecting uh, great reconstruction projects uh, where I naively thought I would be you know, a good soldier taking part of that great reconstruction project. Obviously, Beirut was not rebuilt, uh, but this is beyond, uh, you know, this is not a question of architecture, this, is, this goes way beyond, uh, um, the, the institutions were not rebuilt, uh, there was no consensus over, we need not agree over, over a history. So um, I did not do any institutional projects. I did not do any, any noble projects. I worked really in the mud in what is, I worked for banks, for, for the tourism industry. Uh, I did malls uh, in the Arab world. So it's not a very pretty picture, right. but... Uh, yeah, that's why I'm saying I... But then again, conflict is, it keeps coming back as a very, uh, you know, we, 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 uh, I, I was I've been in, I was imprisoned in this. Uh, I was labeled as, as the as the as the architect who architect who who, who dances on graves, because uh, uh, my work was framed in the, on that territory. And it's it's, it's uh, we didn't do just that. 
Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on the residential sector, uh, but strangely, when my work does not take very frontally the issue of war and does not tackle with these issues that uh, that frame me very and, and put me very safely on the territory of conflict, uh, uh, it doesn't seem to be very interesting for other people. When I think that uh, this is not true, we've tackled much more complex issues later on that were that did not have to do with this uh, with this very flashy exoticism of war that seems to attract uh, uh, everybody, and not only in architecture, in, in contemporary art. Uh, you know, there is an orgy of, of that now. Uh, and, uh, and, and strangely, uh, at some point, if you did not do what my generation, if you did not tackle the subject of all this passage obligé, uh, if you were an ovni, people did not uh, listen to you. So this is dangerous. There are other things that work uh, in Beirut uh, and in the Arab world in general. Uh, that are not so literally connected to conflict, and uh, they're far more complex. They're not just the basic mechanisms of survival. Uh, they're very interesting things that are at work. Right. Okay. Um, I just want to respond to this point of uh, the value of conflict or the issue of conflict and responding to conflict. And in the case of of Cairo, we I'm. I'm more of an optimistic person. I like to look at it as an opportunity, and I don't think learning from Cairo would have come together without the conflict that happened. Um, and it, it forces you to be introspective, and it forces you to rethink what you're doing, and it forces you to perhaps uh, redefine some things. And I think semantics play a big role in this by just naming something. Uh, you change your people's perception of it. So in our work in studio, just by naming a city uh, a juxtapolis, you force students to think of it as more than just a map on a piece of paper. They have to think of it as its layers, its economy, um, its sociology, its cultural heritage. They, and the work that I find we do, is the best work is the work that addresses as many layers as possible. Uh, and the other definition that we've really been uh, taking a second look at is this definition of informality and defining, and it was very interesting having this conversation south-south from uh, South America and India and Egypt and South Africa, what informality meant. Is it about ownership? Is it about structure? Is it about permanence? Um, is it about legality? Uh, is it about who occupies the space? So it suddenly becomes formal if someone uh, approved occupies the space. So it, I think just this ba umbrella term of informality, and that to me are all the results that were valuable from the conflict that our city has been going through for us to redefine our roles moving forward as mediators, as negotiators. Uh, someone used, Bernard used the I idea of the guerrilla architect that kind of goes out and gets things done. So we've, had, we've been forced to redefine what we're doing, and I think that's very important. Uh, my case is a uh, little bit difficult to describe since it's a radical case, actually. Um, um, experience, uh, I, I would say, completely different uh, environment, which is uh, controlled by the continuous colonial uh, regime. Uh, and uh, since uh, we are uh, under occupation, so our part of producing the <coughs> Architecture and the city is not of uh, a matter of representation. It's more about uh, existing, and surviving, uh, struggling, and uh, above all, uh, resistance. So it's a different m meaning, I would say, of uh, uh, doing architecture. And uh, although all these conditions are forcing us to l limit our, um, I would say, um, aspiration, but still there are, uh, I mean, hope for for bringing a kind of representation through architecture. So uh, it's a quite a different uh, experience of a day than the rest of the Arab world. Okay. I think we should open open up questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, hi. I wanted to ask a question to Bernard, or it's more like a commentary. Um, so this attraction to war, I think it comes from the idea of playfulness. And I can't stop but think about J.G. Ballard's War Fever in 1990, where he, in his short story, satirically describes Beirut as this war lab. Uh, and for the rest of the world to be in peace, kind of the Middle East or Beirut has to always be in war. And that kind of 
it's kind of a playful, you can't tackle Lebanon, and Lebanese are in, in general like sarcastic and playful people. That's why they, like, they don't enjoy war, but they've been surrounded by it because it's kind of this chaos of playfulness. And, and we are in general, uh, as a people, like we love to just to take things lightly, and that's the only way to be able to the new page of architecture in Beirut. I think to represent the identity of people in Lebanon has to kind of be playful, and and I think okay. Bernard the does that. Question. So the question okay. is, um, I don't know. Maybe it's not a so it's. Because of this pessimism, I think, it's not an optimism, but it's like really diving into the pessimism to find this kind of irony and playfulness. And I think all the projects that are tackling the Middle East show this sense of playfulness yeah. and materiality and, and program. And yeah, but, but you, you, you use the word that, that disturbed me, cynical. I'm not cynical. No. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm really not. I'm not cynical. And I'm not, uh, uh, I don't like cynical people. <laughs> And I suspect you were, you were born uh, after the war, or you shouldn't go through it. Um, so I'm not sure how playful it was for, for people that, that no, the, the chaos, the, the chaos of it is a sense of playfulness, not that it's a playful situation. I mean, it's a very serious situation, but to design, I feel now, if you, you can't, you have to kind of step back and I feel take it with a sense of lightness, the architecture design of it. Call me a romantic. Sure. Call me a romantic, not a cynical. Definitely need night nightclubs. That's one thing. Sure. Romantic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other yeah. questions? Yeah. This one in the front. Oh. Um, hi. This is also for uh, for Bernard, but also could be like answered for different like cities. Um, you say that architecture has to be contextual. But in like Lebanon, it has been very romanticized, and we're going back to like the pre-French mandate time. And you want to go back and center interview, say, to the 50s and 60s, where we embrace uh, modernity and we try to create. But like, and then you go into the war, like representing the war, and they, you said they put you in the box of the architect dancing on gray, uh, on the graves. So my question is. You, and then you say you want to contradict yourself from one corner to the other of the street. So what would your perception of a city be in the sense that does it need to have a uniform, stylistic um, approach to it? And then that could be like answered for like different cities. So you see that it should be like each structure should fit in the city or should just raise questions and interpret like the viewer to think about different rhetorics and different ideas. Her question is a bit complicated, but but uh, I think in in um, in Beirut it's it's uh, it's it's very difficult because in, on every on every side there is a there is a there is a very specific set of situations that you have to work with. So um, I think the, the the minute my buildings start to look alike, there will be a problem, uh, and. Uh, but I, I'm not interested in representing war or representing any. I think I think I think it's very reductive to think uh, that architecture should only be or is represents anything. I think the minute it represents something, it it just stands behind a history that is in the making or a phenomenon that is in the making. I'd like to think this is why I tried to find allies and 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 friends outside of uh, the cocoon of architecture because I'd like to think that it is possible to uh, to put together. Uh, apparatuses, I call them in French, uh, the dispositif, huh? things that uh, that you don't just contemplate. Uh, and I'm, I'm still one of those romantics. Can the, who can think the informal um, I'm, answer I'm, any I'm, of the I'm any of the things that you're? Can what? Can what Magda is is doing? Can the in can the, does it always have to go to entertainment or can it be informal? Oh, it's got nothing. It's got nothing to do. It's not. It's got nothing to do with with, with to entertainment. conflict and representation. It does. It does. It just no, introduces a normal. But it's, it's this idea of representing a, a phenomenon, which I think is 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 not is not very interesting. Uh, I'd like to think that it is possible for it is still possible for an architect to take part in, to take part in the making of, of, of meaning, and not just uh, and not just to present uh, something. Uh, I, I, I think uh, it would be sad that we would be dragging behind and trying to to represent uh, uh, 
a culture that is in the making. We should, we should, we should still I aim at being. But I just, but I don't, I don't want to end the panel saying, you know, that you're not um, responding to conflict, and everybody else on this panel is. I think ev all the panelists are. I'm not in talking about conflict here. I'm talking about representation. No, okay. I'm Same, talking about representation. But, but we, the way we've defined representation at the conference is so. Uh, so includes what you what you I, do. I understand, I understand, yeah. but I'm saying that I, 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 I'm hoping that my work does not just represent things that have happened. I'm hoping that my work will be will t will really take part in making in the making of a context mm -hmm. and not just representing a context. I think it's very reductive to think that architecture just represents <coughs> culture or represents yeah. something. Representation it's is an act of, yeah, we're over it's time. An act of it's, <laughs> it's, it's active, it's an active part of construction, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. out of time. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.